Hebrews 11.6, a good summary maybe of their life. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Mm -hmm. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hi, I'm Brandon Briscoe, and welcome to another episode of The Postscript, Living Faith Bible Institute's weekly podcast and YouTube series devoted to interviewing pastors and professors from LFBI and across the Living Faith Fellowship. If you've been with us for any length of time, you know that we like to do a lot of episodes on the topic of missions. We like to talk about uh, what the Bible says about missions. We like to talk about strategy for missions. And uh, we like to talk about missionaries and discuss uh, the missionaries of old. And we've done a series of episodes recently called Unknown Missionaries, where we take the life of a missionary that's not often talked about, and we look more closely at what they did, what they dedicated to the Lord, what their legacy is in missions. They might not be someone who's talked about very often, uh, but they had an impact on the world and, and they're worth us discussing and learning from. And so, uh, as usual, uh, I've invited Pastor James Fife, former missionary to Southeast Asia and professor of missiology at Living Faith Bible Institute, to talk about a woman named Narcissa Whitman, uh, who was a missionary to the Cayuse Indians in the Northwest Territories of the United States around uh, the beginning of the 19th century. And so with that, James, welcome to the show. Good morning. Thanks. Uh, our first woman on Unknown Missionaries. Yeah. Long time coming. Probably yeah. should have got there quicker. Yeah. So Narcissa, strange name. Yeah, that's a little unfortunate name there. Yeah, for sure. I think lots of names were unfortunate at the beginning of the 19th century. Well, yeah, and they'll probably say the same about our names 200 years from now. That's probably true. Yeah. Uh, James is is one of those classic names. Never goes out of no, style. No, never goes out of style. It, yeah, Brandon's but, already out of style. No one names their kid Brandon anymore. That was a phenomenon of the 80s. Right. You got to go with good, strong, kingly names. Yeah, yeah. Well, James. Yeah, it's good. It's a good, you got a good name. I can't, I can't deny that. No, thank you. It's a good name. Narcissa, not, not so much. Well, Has not withstood the, the test of time. No, maybe not the best, <laughs> but, but she's got a really, aside. yeah, she's got a really interesting story. Yeah. Um, and actually we should point out that getting here really to, to where we're talking about this lady is because your daughter put us oh, on blast. That's true. I think she deserves a shout out. Yeah, the, the kids like to listen to the postscript yeah. on Monday mornings on the way to school. Mm -hmm. And so as much as I hate to hear my own voice, I'll put it on, uh, especially if the if the topic is appropriate for like elementary age kids. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's, it's not always, but, mm -hmm. but they like the Unknown Missionary episodes. And Clementine, uh, not too long ago, made sure I relayed to you that we do a woman missionary. That she's unhappy. Yeah, my with, nine year old. With my choices. She's, she's thus far. A little in life. She's enjoyed that she likes the missionary stories. Yeah. She's like, but why are there no, where, where are the women's stories at? Which is good. I love her heart. Yeah. She's like, don't women do anything in missions? <laughs> Does James not recognize <laughs> what's going on? Yeah, she knows better. So yeah. here we are, yeah. um, honoring her request. Mm hmm. Uh, tell us a little bit about Narcissa. Uh, who who was she? What was her upbringing? Yeah, and um, how did how did she come to Christ? Yeah, so Narcissa was born in 1808 in Prattsburg, New York. Mm. So we're you know right at 200 years ago mm -hmm. in terms of a timeline: yeah. early 19th century living, uh, early 19th century America. Uh, America is ex expanding westward. But slowly, still most of what we're doing is, is mm -hmm. East Coast and now into uh, St. Louis, probably kind of the, the furthest of major expansion. Right. Uh, so that's life. Um, the, in terms of a little bit of maybe biblical, not biblical, but just Christian history, the First Great Awakening happened in the 1730s and 40s. Mm -hmm. So uh, that impacted her parents. Uh, they were Christian. She's born into a, a believing home. Uh, they they had some some influences that came out her parents and grandparents of that first great awakening second great awakening begins right about the same time she's born so mm -hmm. 1800s 1830 roughly is that second great awakening time period so she's born into that that's focused in the northeast so up in mm -hmm. new york a lot of revivals happening um a, a guy named charles 
Grandinson Finney was dubbed as the father of modern revivalism. He's mm -hmm. preaching. He's born in 1790. So, you know, and, and by the 18 teens, he's, he's a great preacher. Right. Right. So that's kind of the, the climate that she's born into. Christian mm -hmm. family, uh, revivals happening around her. She was taken to revival meetings, grew up in the church. So she accepted Christ uh, pretty young. I think you said age 11 is when uh, she came to, to know Christ. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So 11 years old, um, about the, you know, the age of your and my children. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, uh, she put her faith in Christ, but then she's at one of these uh, revival meetings uh, when she's 16 and hears, you know, somebody preaching on missions and at 16 gives her life to mission. She's like, Hey, I think God is calling me yeah. to be a missionary. And so here's a 16 year old kid. And then this again comes out of early exposure, um, to, mm -hmm. to all things, uh, biblical in the home. And then, uh, as, as she writes, you know, even from a young age, she was, a, she kept, kept journals, wrote a lot of letters. And this is actually how we know so much about her mm -hmm. and her life. But, uh, she was reading, uh, magazines and looking at stories of some of the missionaries that had gone before her. And she's inspired, um, by the stories. Mm. So I don't know, maybe that's, that's part of why we do this. This is one of the prayers that right, yeah. you know, Clementine's going to get to watch this. Right, and yeah. Like, Hey, there's women in missions. <laughs> and yeah. then she's going to walk away going, well, I can do that too. Yeah, for sure. Now, now Narcissa grew up in kind of a working class family. So she was also tough. So if we're talking mm -hmm. about like what she was learning, she was learning the Bible, mm -hmm. but she was also learning to kind of have a thick skin and to be tough, which, you know, is kind of rare nowadays. Right. Um, you know, lots of 11 year olds, uh, yeah. 16 year olds they're, they're, you know, they want to sit around and play video games and mm -hmm. be coddled a bunch. Um, mm -hmm. but, but that's not her upbringing. So she's prepared for the, the hard work ahead of her. Yeah. And that wasn't the upbringing for most at that, you know, just time in life and you didn't have indoor plumbing, you know, you didn't have mm -hmm. electricity, you didn't have all these things. So it was a harder life. She was educated. Uh, yeah. In spite of the the hard upbringing, so she could read and write. You know, she was, especially for being a woman, had a greater education and access to education than uh, a lot of maybe we'd say the general female population mm -hmm. at the time. She ends up getting a college education and becomes a, a teacher as well. So she did grow up working, but at the same time um, had had some good um, education behind her as well. What do we know about her personality? I mean, the letters give us a lot of an, an impression of who she was. Mm -hmm. um, what do you sense about her, you know, in terms of her personality and the way that she expresses herself? Well, one thing that we see is that she was 16. She filled out an application to become a missionary. Mm. And she was rejected on, on the ground that she was a single and young uh, lady, primarily single. I don't think they... 16 wasn't as much a problem as just being single. Just being single. <laughs> that yeah. points to the time. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but she doesn't give up on that. So it shows mm -hmm. that she was a very persistent uh, woman. She had a personality that, that was willing to, to again, as you mentioned, work hard, to, to labor, to not give up on things. It's actually going to be another uh, 10, 12 years before she ends up on the mission field. Mm -hmm. She'll put in more applications to be a missionary. She'll be rejected again. So at least in this early years of her life, she's someone who can handle uh, rejection. She's thick skinned enough. But at the same time, when you look at the pictures and read the physical descriptions of her, she was described as being very soft, uh, round, big eyes. Hmm. Um, you know, so she was maybe a bit of a contrast in terms of the way that she looked and then the way that she could come off as well. Some of her personality, and we may come back to this later, um, wasn't well received with the Indians uh, mm. because of her, uh, maybe her her directness and her, and her boldness and the fact that she was educated and, and kind of knew how to, mm. was accustomed to carrying herself and presenting herself in a certain way. Yeah, maybe a little bit overconfident maybe. in her presentation. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, I mean, it was that kind of, of attitude that got her to the field. And it, uh, certainly it was tough, the idea of being a female and um, being called to the field at that yeah. time, especially, right. would have been really difficult. Maybe tell us what, what were some of the hurdles? Obviously, they didn't want her going on the field without a husband, mm -hmm. but what are some other, of the other hurdles that a woman would have run into in terms of preparation for missions? She needs to get married. 
And that's what she was told. Twice she filled out an application. She tries to become a missionary. And they tell her, well, you're single. So 16, and then again at 26. So now she's an adult. She's educated. Uh, she's been serving in her church. She, you know, she is leading Sunday schools. She's a teacher. Mm. You know, she's grown a lot. She has all kinds of qualifications behind her. And still they said, well, you don't have a husband. So she finds one. So she finds one. Yeah. Which is a plan. That's a great plan. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's one of the things I love about, about Narcissa is her approach to marriage. Um, cause she wrote, um, back when she was 16, she said, I, I frequently desire to go to the heathen, but only half heartedly. And it was not until the first Monday of January, 1824, that I felt to consecrate myself without reserve to the missionary work, waiting the leadings of Providence concerning me. Right. Hmm. So here's a 16 year old, very mature statement saying, I'm going to wholly give myself over to, to God's mission. So that even uh, guided her approach towards marriage. She's 26 and educated and, you know, is, has actually been pursued and had marriage proposals from others already that she had turned down. She said no, because the mission comes first in, in my life and in my world. So right. she, here's a woman, uh, and especially at that time, you know, 26 would have been an old maid. Mm-hmm. You're getting yeah. quite old. Yeah, the... The uh, people in the community are starting to talk about you at that point. Uh, yeah. 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 You don't have a kid by You're the weirdo. 19. <laughs> right. 18. You haven't know, got one Or out. 16, for crying out loud. I mean, sounds she's like. marrying age by then, yeah. yeah. If you would have been married at 16, you could have gone. Gosh. So she's looking for someone who is also interested in missions. Like yeah. she, she's looking for someone who's going to be as sold out as she is. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So... Uh, you know, at the same time, God is in uh, is at work in, in a young man's heart. Uh, his name is Marcus, uh, Marcus Whitman. So she is actually Narcissa Prentiss mm-hmm. uh, is her maiden name. Marcus Whitman is born and grew up about 20 miles away from where Narcissa was born and grew up. And both ran in the same kind of revival, church circles, Protestant circles, yet never met. Mm-hmm. Uh, Marcus uh, was trained as a physician and also as a preacher. Mm. And I guess he'd actually been to and preached in Narcissa's church and then was at a prayer meeting in Narcissa's, you know, childhood home, mm. uh, family home. She's a young adult at this time, and so mm-hmm. is he. But they never met. She mm. was off doing, you know, tending to the, to the children. And uh, so Marcus Whitman gets a heart uh, for missions as well uh, through, again, preaching at a revival and decides that he will give his, his life to uh, reaching the, the Indians, the heathen Indians in the Western part of the United States. Mm. And uh, he actually gets the same response. Initially, they tell him that they're reluctant to send him to the mission field because he is also single. Mm-hmm. And they were worried about the temptations of the native women. So, okay. Yeah, that's I, a quote? Yeah. Oh. Okay. That's a quote. Yeah. Yeah. They were worried about the temptations and the native. I mean, they're, they're, the native look, they're, let, let, let's be honest. There's yeah. something to, let's, let's be honest about the whole thing. There is something to going to the mission field with a partner. Mm-hmm. It, it certainly isn't necessary. I mean, Paul and his team, most of his squad were single dudes. Yeah. Um, so there, there's nothing to be dogmatic about right. as it concerns marriage or singleness. But you were a missionary on the field with a wife. I went in both states. And, and yeah, yeah, right. And before that, right. you went to El Salvador mm-hmm. as a single man. Yeah. Um, it's, there's benefits to both. Absolutely. Right. And there's, oh, and there's yeah. weaknesses in both, in both Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And Paul addresses that. Yes. Uh, you know, you, you have a lot of instruction on both sides of that coin. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, with, you know, a, a, with a key heart uh, being God can use me where I'm at right now. Yeah. I, I don't need to seek to be married in order to be given to the Lord and use of the Lord. Uh, nor if I'm married, do I need to seek to, <laughs> to be out of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but seeing both states as profitable as unto the Lord. And from the very beginning, of course, um, Adam, it's not good for you to be alone. Right. Uh, here's a help meet for the work that you have. So there's absolutely benefit. Uh, and to finding that, but th- at this time, I mean, this is like a this is institutional thinking. Yeah, yeah. this is a this is a cultural thing mm-hmm. in America at that time. Yeah, yep. 
So, uh, so God's preparing Marcus, uh, and Marcus has the same uh, mindset. Uh, he, so he's now uh, kind of on deputation. He's trying to raise support, and at the same time, he's like, well, I guess I need to find a wife. Uh, he meets uh, Narcissa, and they kind of approach uh, you know, marriage, maybe from our perspective, a little, I don't know, businesslike. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. like it's this this it's just an agreement that betters the the, the God's mission. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, that was the driving force for it. Right now, it worked out that he's educated and she's educated, and she was you know attractive, and all of those things were, I guess, there as well. But at at the very beginning, it they were even set up by somebody else who goes, "Wait, I know this girl named uh, Narcissa who keeps writing me letters." and wants to be a missionary, why don't you go meet her and marry her and we'll send you mm-hmm. guys together. So it was almost an arranged um, marriage yeah. by a, outs- a pastor yeah. on the outside saying, this is this would be good for the mission. Yeah. Even there, I think it is important. Maybe, maybe that's out of balance in some way in the way that we think today, but uh, I do think it is important for people to recognize that this question of the mission, God's word, the local church, foundational doctrines associated with what we believe are critical in terms of finding a spouse. Mm -hmm. It's really easy to compromise because, you know, uh, you believe that romantically you're compatible with a person or Mm -hmm. you're attracted to a certain type of person. It makes it really easy for you to compromise the more important things, but, but putting the mission first, uh, is really how we should, we should all be thinking. Yeah, exactly. uh, in, In terms of finding a spouse. Yeah. And I think that pressure falls harder on the women, mm-hmm. you know, single women, uh, as you, as you get a little older, had, there's more just societal pressures mm-hmm. that says something's not right. So I think, you know, the warning to the, to the women, especially the ones that you're pastoring mm-hmm. at, at that age where they're looking for a spouse is, uh, don't be tempted to compromise. Like yeah. if you know, God has a specific calling on your life. If you as a woman say, I, I believe that God wants me in missions or in a you know, specific area uh, of ministry, uh, finding a guy who has a different call in different direction uh, might be settling. Yeah. Like maybe, maybe God wants you to keep waiting and keep looking. Right. Uh, and, and you know, you've seen it. Yeah. We've seen it. For sure. It's out there. So, so can I address something else that I think is important historically? Yeah. Is that, you know, at this point in North America, there, you know, really from the very first settlers, even in the South America, Central America region of the world, there were many different denominations. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're talking about Catholics and Protestants and, and whatnot, who were doing missions work mm-hmm. in North America all of them doing it different ways. Um, every, you know, regardless of the denomination, there were bad things, there were good things. Um, but, but I want to talk about what's, what's happening in this time frame. I think, is important. So what were missions to tribal people like in North America at this time? Like missionaries were there doing the work. What were their motives? What were the ulterior motives? Like, maybe get un, uh, unpack some of this a little bit because I think it'll point to both the strengths of what Narcissa did mm-hmm. in her own missions work, but also the weaknesses of what she was doing, which we're, we're going to get to. Yeah. So the, the culture um, at that time, we're coming out of, you know, great uh, centuries of, of the, the Western world, the white world colonizing and, and, propagating a, a kingdom, expanding kingdoms all over the world. So we have that mindset. Yeah, that empirical. Is, in, in, yeah, exactly. Colonialism, well, those ideas that, that are just kind of driven into the culture. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately are not shaken free completely, even by biblical culture. You, you, so a lot of the Christians are looking at missions. Yes, we need to uh, evangelize and, and Christianize, mm-hmm. uh, as they would say, but also we need to civilize. Mm -hmm. So the approach to um, missions among Native Americans was, well, they are are these ruthless and rugged people. And if they had, and we see the same thing in Africa and and all over the place, if they had shirts, if they had shoes, uh, if they had better homes, you know, if we could add all of these things into the gospel message, then they would be better off, Mm -hmm. right? Instead of 
So the primary focus wasn't, let's take the gospel message and let's let the word of God speak and then see how the word of God changes hearts right? and then how that plays out or doesn't play out culturally. It was, let's take a, a, a Christianizing and civilizing message. And mm-hmm. so that actually was, uh, unfortunately, uh, a big part of the objective as well. And when they, when they went out, and mm-hmm. they engaged with, um, you know, native peoples, uh, whether in Central America or, or in, you know, North America. Um, there was there was issues with the way in which they received truth. So they they hear the message of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. And I think it was fairly common for uh, that message to be received at some level, but it was it was added into or blended into mm-hmm. what we would call spiritual constructs that they, that already exist, spiritism and the animism of the peoples. And so it didn't always take, which was also a problem. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. So you see the same thing currently playing out in India mm-hmm. or, or in places where you have already, you know, a plethora of gods. And so you add Jesus on top of what you already have. Uh, same thing was happening then. Um, working, you know, these new ideas into your pre-existing construct. So, so it's not Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. It's we'll add him in, and he fits. He where he fits, he fits, and we'll right. we'll make that a part. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a good another good example. Bruce Olson's book, Bruschko. Mm-hmm. He talks through those ideas and how to how to bring Jesus into a culture. Um, and, and then separate the, the components of, of spiritism and religion that are already there away from what is true. Mm -hmm. So, so that's a problem. Also, I mean, issues of travel and disease, Mm -hmm. uh, the violence, these are violent cultures, uh, for the most part, um, centuries of violence between Mm -hmm. tribes and, and, uh, and so, you know, um, not civilized, mm-hmm. but then also just hard to get to. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of components. I mean, it takes a lot for someone to commit to doing something like this. Yeah, absolutely. So so Marcus and Narcissa get married and they're in New York. Uh, the day after their wedding, they leave to be missionaries. Uh, so there's the honeymoon. Wow. But, but what that meant was uh, a seven month journey by boat, by horseback, by foot, from New York all the way to what is modern day uh, Washington state. At mm. that time it was called the Oregon country. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, you go as far as St. Louis and it was kind of the outer bounds of, of what was developed. And then from there it's the Oregon trail. And actually, uh, you know, they had recruited one other couple to come with them, the Spaldings and Narcissa Whitman and Mrs. Spaulding are the first two white women to cross the Rockies. So men had been going as fur traders and had interacted with uh, the Indians already. Mm-hmm. Uh, so she actually does have a, a place in history as well. Um, yeah, wow. So it's a pretty big deal. Uh, so it's referral to unknown. Yeah, I mean, I mean she's a pioneer. Yeah. Um, and along the way, it was, yeah, it's hard travel. It's uh, it's on a, a carriage without shocks uh, and springs right. and you just bounce it along uh, a hard path until the path uh, becomes too steep and too great. And then you're on horseback. Um, not, you know, they talked about crossing the Rockies, like, like it was the Bermuda triangle. Like you were mm-hmm. going into this great unknown, like nobody comes back from there type of idea. I mean, I've been to the Rockies a lot of times in my life and mm-hmm. it is a vast huge i mean driving up yeah. the mountains of the rockies is is somewhat tedious yeah it's an intense thought that you would have to do that on horseback on, or by foot on horseback and foot so for 7 months and as they went um you know they had to lighten the load as they went uh they were traveling with a, a fur trading group so mostly you know a large group of men plus a few missionaries and, and she writes in her journal and in her letters about you know every day they're throwing things out so really making literal and practical this idea of lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth because mm-hmm. they're throwing away all of their possessions as they go, just leaving them littered along the Oregon trail yeah. to take only what's necessary. Yeah. Uh, and then they're down to the, f- the clothes they're wearing and, and the food that they get and mm. they arrive. And actually there was a camp in Wyoming that uh, they arrive at and they, she mentions we get to wash our clothes and, uh, for the first time in months. You know, so that's mm. where they've gotten to. They don't have changes of clothes and that's where they're at. I know some guys that are preparing for that kind of missions work 
yeah. in, in the young adult ministry by just not washing <laughs> washing they're, clothes for months. They're equipped they're, for they're, that. They're ready for that aspect of the missions work. Yeah. So they, they kind of identify with this <laughs> idea of being strangers and pilgrims. Yeah. Not because they've gone, but just because they're strange. Yeah. Just because they're strange. Yeah, for okay. sure. All right. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a lot. Um, so they head out there, they, they get there after a very hard, uh, you know, hard seven months on the trail mm-hmm. and they get to the Cayuse Indians. I think I'm saying that right. I think so too. But I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm familiar with this tribe. I've never seen them in, you know, historically speaking. I'm sure yeah. this is a common a, a common tribal name, maybe in, in the Northwest even today. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But but these this is the people group that they go and they meet with. Uh, tell me about them. Mm-hmm. Who, the, the, the who of, you know, who they are, uh, where are they living, mm-hmm. and, um, and how are they being reached? So there are... Were a number of tribes mm-hmm. uh, up in the northwest. The Cayuse were known for being the the toughest, the most warrior like, uh, most staunch, um, more difficult people uh, compared to some of the other tribes mm-hmm. in the area. Um, they once they discovered or, or obtained horses, they became conquerors. Mm-hmm. So even before they were they were conquerors, but on foot, which limits how far you can go. Once they mm-hmm. got horses. Uh, it said that they they kind of owned or patrolled or governed uh, six million acres of land. I think was the number I read. <sighs> so they just had this massive expanse of space where uh, they they just roam uh, along some of the the big rivers up there. Um, Walla Walla mm. is one that yeah Walla Walla Washington right yeah exactly. Yeah. So they're in that area, but they mm. so they they're overtaking other tribes. They're a difficult people. Uh, the Spaldings, who were traveling along with the Whitmans, had decided to go and focus on a different tribe about 150 miles away. And they had warned Marcus and Narcissa that this tribe, the, the Cayuse that you were going after, they're a very, very difficult people. They're mm. not known for uh, letting others come in. They're known to clinging to their culture. Uh, they're known to being very much, this is who we are. Um, and they're not the ones who are going to change. Mm. So yeah, a hard, a hard people. Um, I've not been up in that area. I, like you, hadn't heard of them prior mm-hmm. to actually reading uh, through uh, Narcissa's letters and, and, and journal. So uh, I did a little looking at them historically. They, they still have a, a tribal land, I don't know, 100,000 a, a acres, mm-hmm. or something they've put them on a reserve. Mm-hmm. Um, but they, they've continued to preserve their culture even mm. still. So how did they approach the Cayuse, what, what, what were they doing? What were their methods of, of reaching this mm-hmm. this group of people? Since, uh, well, you know, you have to settle yourself. You need to build a home. Um, and since a large part of their focus was also civilizing, they took, um, you know, an, Amer- an, an American, Eastern American perspective of, you know, kind of homesteading. Yeah. So they immediately started cutting down trees, building houses. Um, The Cayuse were a little more nomadic. They lived in tents. They could be on the go. So they are establishing permanent structures, permanent places to live. They build uh, big homes, bigger halls. They they want to have a place where they can bring the Indians in. So they they intentionally built big, long dining halls. We want to engage with the Indians. Uh, but a little bit of it was we'll engage with the Indians on our terms. Uh, they have to come and and kind of conform to to who we are. They have to come into the house. They have to do these things instead of um, uh, you know you'll see a, a, an opposing idea of it's the missionary's responsibility to go and to conform to mold to whatever the the cultural right. st- standards are there. So Marcus isn't the guy who's out on horseback dressing like an Indian. Uh, riding with the Indians, ministering to them, preaching to them through daily living and daily life. He's homesteading, you know. He's planting crops. He's doing all the stuff, and they're bringing uh, the Indians into them. So this speaks to you know a problem in church planting and missions work even today. Mm-hmm. So you you know a guy who has a call in their life um, is given to, given a template for what uh, missions should be or, or what ministry should be. And they go into a community, they go into a, maybe a, a foreign culture of some mm-hmm. sort. And they kind of, again, they impose uh, what they think 
church planting looks like. They, mm-hmm. they have a methodology. They have an, an outreach method that they use or a strategy that they use. And, and a lot of the time it looks like come and see what we're doing. Mm-hmm. And once you get a look, once you see how awesome the way we do yeah. stuff is, you'll just want to be a part of our church or you'll right. want versus integration and, um, you know, uh, giving yourself over to a culture um, and accommodating cultural things or customs, uh, people will, you know, it doesn't matter, it, even in the States, someone, you want to go plant a church, you know, 30 or 40 miles from here. Mm-hmm. Uh, people do this. Pe- people just assume that if they build an edifice, mm-hmm. that people are going to want to come there. And that's just not how it works. Hey, thank you so much for listening to the show. We're going to pause right here for just a second so we can hear from one of our students from the Living Faith Bible Institute. Hi, my name is John Scott. I go to Northside Baptist Church in Columbus, Ohio, and I'm an LFBI student. LFBI is spectacular. It's an institute that is taught by pastors as opposed to professors, people who are actually in the ministry with their feet on the ground in the dirt, making disciples, evangelizing, and actually loving people. And it's the best resource out there for any sort of Bible teaching. In my life, I've used many of the classes. One in particular is the evangelism class. After going through the course, I was able to transform by God's grace the whole method and the and the whole process of the Bible study where it is more evangelistic and we're able to actually reach out to people and then actually study the Bible together. It's something so simple. But man, it's it's because of LFBI that that changed. Now now we're able to plug that into an evangelistic ministry that we have out of our church. So I couldn't recommend LFBI more. To enroll for classes, visit lfbi.org. To support LFBI, please visit lfbi.org slash support. Yeah, absolutely. And so we have a big conversation about this in our Intro to Missions course, um, which you can take at LFBI. Mm-hmm. Uh, dot org. Uh, probably, <laughs> I think we're doing it. We're offering it in January. That's right. If I remember right. So yeah. it's not this upcoming fall semester. It'll be the next spring. Yeah. Um, but it is. It's a big historical struggle and current struggle. How do we get people on the mission field and then actually at a place where they can engage with people? Because our our goal isn't to transplant people to live their lives. Our goal is to engage with the people that are there. Yeah. So yeah. Um, and I think, you know, principally, uh, whether you're going or whether you're here, you know, in terms of ministry and, and leadership development, uh, the mature are always more capable of bending and being flexible than the immature. Mm-hmm. You know, so for you and me, as we lead and train people up where we see areas of weakness or we see just things that are, that are different, um, taking that really hard and rigid stance when you don't need to, when it's right. not biblically imposed, yeah, uh, is a dangerous thing, and we should be the ones who, as as mature believers, who say, "Well, I can bend, I can be patient, you know, I can give here." I think yeah. it's, you know, it's that sign of immaturity and still growing to say, "Well, it has to be this right. way." Right? Yeah, the, rigid, everything so. is black and white. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's tough, and it makes it difficult on their ability to minister. And, yeah, and it kind of um, Marcus and Narcissa find out that that it doesn't is not actually working. Yeah. So, um, you know, and just taking a quick step back, something to toss in on the journey, that seven month journey, they end up getting pregnant Mm -hmm. and they do give birth to a a daughter right after they land in, in Walla Walla in the, in the Cayuse area. So they have a daughter, uh, they're, they're building these homes and they're trying to reach out. I mean, no doubt they love the Lord. They've sacrificed a lot and they're trying to love the people. But uh, as time goes on, there becomes this great strife between uh, the Whitmans and the Cayuse to where the Cayuse are saying, look, you came in and took some of our land. Uh, You're using our resources. Everything you grow, you're growing out of our land. Uh, All the food that you have uh, is our food. You know, so there is this like you're you've kind of come in and. Mm-hmm. And took over, and so it started to to, to create a, a division early on between the two groups. There's you know this this outpost, and then there's this six million acres of you know Indians that are running wild and have a, a way of life. And so mm-hmm. it did strain the work and create uh, uh, some difficulties, and then being able to to reach the people. Mm. So the Indians were. 
from from their perspective, Narcissa writes about this too. That she she said, well, the Indians just keep coming over and demanding things of us. They want more food. They want more resources. They want more tools. They want more of this and that. So she feels like we're just here to give them things. And you know, their side was, well, that you just came and took, and everything you're producing comes from us. Right. You, know, you have a lot more than us now, so mm-hmm. give it back. And then to add to that, the tension that exists in the mission itself. Right. Um, they they lose their two year old. Yeah. Right. The the this baby that they had. Um, it dr- drowns, mm-hmm. which is devastating. Mm-hmm. And you, it, it begins to impact the work. Greatly, yeah. So, you know, you read Narcissa's early journals. She loves the whole adventure. She loves the idea. She Every day she loves what she's seeing, new frontiers. See, first time she sees the Indian, she loves it. Uh, the idea of new people, she loves all of it. She, she loves her daughter deeply. At two years old, they're just sitting around reading and they realize they don't know where she is. They find her in the river and she's drowned. And, uh, you know, that obviously is a devastating and hard thing. Um, but Narcissa, and, and maybe to Marcus's discredit uh, as well, maybe he didn't help to, to manage his wife through that season. She wasn't equipped to, to work through it biblically. Um, and, and they had nobody else, mm-hmm. right? In a season like that, you're going to need... Uh, more help, but she, her letters uh, start blatantly coming out and telling you she's becoming more and more depressed, more and more disconnected from the work. It's all kind of rooted back to not being able to process the loss of her daughter. They never end up having any more children, and she uh, retreats and withdraws more and more mm-hmm. from from everything that is happening in life. And and some other things are expressed in her letters too, like lack of communication from. Mm-hmm you know, her sending organization and church, mm-hmm. um, not feeling as though that there's a spiritual connection, uh, the lack of fellowship, um, the, de- the deterioration of the team itself that they mm-hmm. went out there with, um, all of these things begin to affect her outlook as well. Yeah. She writes specifically, even in the journey, you know, that seven months of travel and they're sending letters back and she, she'll say over and over, how come I haven't received a letter from you? Oh, I wish... Uh, I could, I could, you know, just read what's going on in your lives there. Mm-hmm. At the same time, she uh, makes comments like, "I know you guys are praying for me. We feel the power of your prayers. We see things playing out in our lives every day." So she is making a plea, and I think giving us some good insight and instruction. Yeah, explain in, that dynamic in terms of you know how do we support um, yeah. as a missionary and having been there. You know, we were on the field in in a hard place in in an isolated place. We went uh, by ourselves as a family, and uh, it you des you, you become desperate to know that the people that you left still have your back or still thinking of you, and just sometimes just to hear from them mm-hmm. uh, it means a lot. And she was she was asking for that initially. But that never, you know, that the church, the people never responded appropriately. Like the, the communication never increases. She never gets what she is longing for in terms of more more communication from right. home. And, 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 you know, going back to your personal experience, mm-hmm. I think that this is, so, you know, when you went out, when you and your family went out, um, you are our first foreign missionary to come mm-hmm. out of our church. Uh, we were still in kind of church plant mode as a, a church ourselves. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that we struggled to know what it looked like to su- to support you. And I think we've learned a lot since then. And oh, I think yeah. you've done a lot to help us actually understand the way that this should work. And so maybe give us just a few principles for what it should look like for a church to support missionaries regularly so that they don't feel alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in terms of communication, especially when you're first sending, I think you want to you want to reach out uh, early and you want to reach out often. You want to make sure that they know the lines of communication are open, that we're with you, that we're behind you, uh, but without being demanding uh, or requiring more back from the missionary. Sometimes it's enough just to receive communication. Mm-hmm. And now that's frustrating. I get it going the other way as a church saying, well, how do we pray for you? Uh, what we don't want to do, you know, as a church here, say as Midtown is send a, a you know, uh, communication out to XYZ missionary 
and say, you have to give us a report every, mm -hmm. every month, send us a, you know, a full report on what's going on. And we need to, you know, we don't want to be burdensome to them in our communication. Right. And sometimes support, you know, we fall into that and we don't want to be, uh, but if we're not careful, we can become this burden in our support. Um, uh, you know, in the modern day, it's a lot easier to communicate. You're not writing letters that take yeah. months. Yeah. Um, so being intentional, if you're a missionary and you're going, be intentional from the get-go. Before I went, I had conversations with a number of guys, uh, you included, saying, hey, you know, uh, reach out and ha ask, ask real questions and ask me how I'm doing. I know I'm not going to have the same type of brotherly uh, accountability there. Mm -hmm. Like, ask me how my marriage is going. Mm -hmm. Ask me how my fathering is going. You know, so having um, planned that in advance, you know, I had people that were willing to reach out and just listen, but also ask me hard questions that no one else was mm -hmm. asking. I thought for me, for me personally, that was really good. And then I set up uh, just a, a regular communication with one of our, you know, key guys back here. Mm -hmm. So we would talk once a month and Zoom or Skype. It was super easy. Mm -hmm. So we could talk through things. And yeah. I think planning that and just working that in is is very important. You teach a, a class in the Bible Institute in our missiology program. We, we offer several classes on missions mm -hmm. to help people in different facets or areas of missions. Uh, we, you know, we got courses that deal with fundraising and preparation mm -hmm. and and all, all that kind of stuff. But we have a, a course that's devoted to support. Right. Um, what are some of the things that we talk about in that class that would, you know, be peripherally re related to what we're talking about even now? Yeah, so we look at that class as support is going far beyond just the financial support because that's initially what we think of. Everybody mm -hmm. needs money to get out onto the field, but we want to think about it in terms of communication support and emotional, moral support. Uh, we want to think about, uh, you know, managing, being tuned in to, you know, details of their life, making sure that we were, send them a card. Let without them, being burdensome. Without being burdensome. Send them a card. This is, you know, hey, we know it's your anniversary. Happy anniversary. Mm -hmm. Like little yeah. things like yeah. that. But we talk about, um, you know, uh, when when needed, uh, re-entry support. Not all yeah. missionaries, you know, this happened with us. We got kicked out of where we were. That transition is a big transition mm -hmm. or next step support. Like uh, even if you're still there in, in your country, but now you've maybe you've grown up another leader and they're taking over and you're transitioning into a new role. Right. Do I stay at the church and how do I maybe go and plant another church? So all these yeah. transition supports, um, we want to focus on those as well. Yeah, that's good. I'm really, really thankful that we offer that content in the Bible Institute. I think it's a missing piece mm -hmm. in a lot of programs and in a lot of churches. So and that'll be uh, this fall. This fall, yeah. This mission's one. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, it'll be really good. So tell us where things kind of turn, because this this isn't... I think when we get to the legacy part, there's there's hope in yeah. the legacy of, of the Whitmans. But in terms of the, their story, mm -hmm. it's pretty tragic. So walk us through what happened. Yeah. So, you know, they've been there two years when their daughter dies. Um, that's a turning point emotionally and spiritually for Narcissa. And you just see her go further and further. You read her letters. They get um, more and more disconnected and aggressive towards the Indians. You know, she no longer enjoys their presence. She complains. She, she's not connected to them. But the same thing with Marcus. You know, Marcus is, is I think, more focused on the civilizing. And so that drives this big wedge. Uh, to cut to the end of the story, um, they had been there 10 years, right? Right about 10 years. And the Indians uh, too are, are frustrated by what they're being offered. They're not seeing great results. They're not seeing a lot uh, in terms of salvations and a church planting. Uh, they're not seeing it. Side note, you know, a lot of that has to do with not keeping the main thing, the mission, right. the mission. Yeah. Um, but you know, their life, their story ends when uh, the tribal leader is frustrated enough that he grabs a large group of men. They come to the Whitman compound uh, with guns and tomahawks and they kill uh, Marcus and Narcissa and 11 other adults. They spare all the children. But And by that point, this thing has grown. Um, there's about 60 people living at the compound. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, Marcus and Narcissa had taken in some children who had been orphaned. Their parents mm. had both died. So they now have seven children that they're raising. 
Mm. Uh, the only female that was killed was Narcissa. Mm. That might say a lot about uh, the relationship and the dynamic. The Indians otherwise spared uh, all of the women and children. But uh, yeah, they killed both of them with, with tomahawk and 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 uh, shotgun. Which um, obviously that that story made its way back to the East Coast, right. and um, there were there was action taken uh, at a governmental. There's an outcry uh, mm -hmm. for for change and reform uh, as it regards how. Um, the uh, you know the way in which we engage with Native Americans, and mm -hmm. so there was a there was a shift that took place culturally n that was not necessarily good or profitable for missions. Yeah, yeah. So in a in an early example of uh, you know political or 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 mass media spin, mm -hmm. you get to tell the story, then you get to tell it your way, mm -hmm. and the, they use that incident, which is now known as the, the Whitman massacre, um, to, to push their objective of civilizing and taking over. So, mm -hmm. you know, that led to more wars with the Indians. Um, and then ultimately the, the U S government taking the territory, putting them onto, onto reserves, you know, killing a whole bunch of, of that tribe. They found, the leader and maybe the, the kind of the five key men that were responsible for the massacre, they, they execute them. Uh, but yeah, so the, the government uses that to accomplish their own personal right. civilizing and expanding goals. So in the immediate aftermath, you know, the whole thing uh, looks to be pretty, pretty bleak. Mm. But there is a, there is a, you know, in the midst of all of that turmoil and hardship, um, there is hope and it does affect the way in which uh, people see missions. So mm -hmm. maybe tell us a little bit about the legacy of someone like Narcissa and Marcus as well uh, and their impact mm -hmm. on on the way in which we approach missions now. Yeah, so again, the immediate aftermath, it's war, it's it's now we're taking over. And and so that there's that kind of season that goes on for the next couple of decades. But then as missionaries come back and come back into that area, they actually find that there is now a Christian witness there among the the Cayuse and among mm -hmm. other Indian tribes. So Marcus and, and Narcissa don't particularly write much about that. They don't see that during their life. But the seeds that they did plant, uh, even, you know, in, in as misguided as we might say some of their philosophy and, and approach was, mm -hmm. the gospel was still going forth. Yeah. Right. And, and God's word doesn't return void yeah. and God is faithful. Right. And so God took, uh, just these broken people that had all both said, we want to give you everything. And they messed up a lot along the way. And maybe the further they went, but they had this, we want to be a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And they struggled with it, but yeah. God used that planted those seeds. So they go back and finally, when you get back to a, okay, let's, let's try to re-engage and evangelize. They see, um, the fruit of this ministry that is now a couple decades dead and gone, um, mm. is actually bearing fruit. Yeah. Which teaches us that, you know, um, even if we're weak, even if we fail, um, that, and even if the the seed is scattered in a way that that is you know unbecoming mm -hmm. <laughs> to a husbandman, uh, that God can still use it, and mm -hmm. God will use it. Any time truth goes forth, God will use it. As you said, it won't return void. But then it lays it lays a foundation for a good, healthy work. And uh, I think that says a lot. Mm -hmm. I think that God honored even just them traveling. You know, just the fact that they went. Yeah. Um, that God honors it and, um, and there's power. I mean, you can imagine what the prayers would look like. And in, in fact, you can read a lot of them. Right. Um, but as they travel full of hope, but just pain and pleasure and every, you know, extreme sense of emotion, they endured and they went through it mm -hmm. uh, for good and for bad. And then God ultimately uses it to establish a future work. Yeah. As I was reading through the journals, um, Hebrews eleven six um, just kind of stuck out to me as as a good summary, maybe of their life. It says, "But without faith, it is impossible to please Him." 
Mm-hmm. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Mm-hmm. And that was their heart position. In spite of all the failures, they walked in faith, uh, and especially in those you know early days, and and uh, that was pleasing. Yeah. And God was able to work with that. Yeah. So. Well, so I don't know if Clementine had this kind of story in mind. Yeah. Uh, when You'll she have requested, to ask her, yeah, report um, back. Yeah, there, I don't think she'll be real stoked at uh, how the story ended. Yeah, maybe not. Um, not quite the uh, Disney mission story, right? But should we do that one next time? Yeah, like that, the more maybe 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 Disney there's a, princess mission story. <laughs> maybe something that ends a little more uplifting. But okay. I think there was a lot a lot of really good principles in yeah. Narcissa's story for us to kind of unpack, which is what our listeners really need for mm-hmm. those who are interested in missions, uh, even ministering in your own community. There are principles here that are absolutely critical for our learning. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, it was it was edifying for me too, reading her journals and just becoming familiar with her life. Lots to learn. Yeah. James, thank you for hanging out with me and being willing to do this. Um, James is getting ready to go uh, with his family for a month, correct? Mm -hmm. A month to Nairobi, uh, Kenya. Yes. uh, Where we are hoping that uh, our church will be able to um, uh, establish a a local church there in Nairobi. There's a group of people that are already meeting as a church, calling themselves Living Faith Nairobi. That's right. Um, Very cool. Yeah. Um, we need to be praying about that. Absolutely. Yeah, it's really exciting. Uh, you know, we've been praying for key men and just for men in general. And uh, just yesterday, I met with two guys that I'm discipling there. Uh, mm. Shout out to Ken. I told him about the postscript oh, just cool. yesterday. He yeah, never cool. heard of the postscript. So, uh, Ken, hopefully, that maybe this is your first episode you're watching. <laughs> uh, a, a man in Nairobi. We. Uh, uh, we were on lesson 18 yesterday, you know, wow. so when I get there, we're going to, and then Sebastian as well, he'll be mm-hmm. finishing discipleship. He's on lesson 17. So yeah, in the next couple of weeks. These are gonna, key men for the work that's happening. In yeah. That, key that young men, college age men, early twenties, um, getting discipled, uh, already evangelizing, already leading people to the Lord and, uh, looking at how to apprentice and, you know, start discipling as well. So mm. yeah, please guys, if you're out there, be praying for what God is doing in Nairobi. Yeah. It's exciting. Praise God. Well, thanks James for hanging out. We love you. Yeah, Grateful thanks. for you. And we want to say thank you to you as well for joining us on another episode of the postscript. Uh, we really do hope these unknown missionary stories are enjoyable, uh, interesting, um, but that they they spark in you a, a desire to share uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, to, to function as a missionary where you live and in your community, and then even to consider or daydream what it would look like for you uh, or your family to go to other places in the world and, and to minister to people uh, with a heart to see them saved and, and to see them... D- creating disciples, de- developing disciples of Jesus Christ. And so LFBI.org is here to support that work. We come alongside local churches uh, to educate and to facilitate and to help as you are developing disciples of your own. And so we want to help you in that work and and provide education for those who are looking to be mature ministers of the gospel. Uh, LFBI.org, you can learn about our vision statement, uh, who we are, our beliefs, and uh, see what our program of study looks like. We want to invite you to check that out. Other than that, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Uh, We'll be back here again uh, next Monday for another episode of The Postscript. Uh, In the meantime, go back and listen to old episodes. You can find all the unknown missionaries uh, stories that we've done so far on YouTube or any of the podcast platforms that you listen to, uh, along with all the other episodes that we've done uh, over the last few years. But we love you. God bless. please leave us a rating and review in order to help other people find our podcast. If you value this show, please help us continue creating content by supporting Living Faith Bible Institute at lfbi.org slash support.